Essentialism, The Disciplined Pursuit of Less by Greg McEwen. The tyranny of the urgent has been an obstacle standing in the way of success for decades. Today, the urgent things that are screaming for our attention have multiplied beyond imagination. This book addresses a problem that has been even more critical in our ever increasingly busy lives. The nutshell of this book is this. The way of the essentialist is the relentless pursuit of less but better. Essentialism is not about how to get more things done, it's about how to get the right things done. The way of the essentialist means living by design, not by default. Instead of making choices reactively, the essentialist deliberately distinguishes the vital few from the trivial many, eliminates the non-essentials, and then removes obstacles so that the essential things have clear, smooth passage. In other words, essentialism is a disciplined, systematic approach for determining where our highest point of contribution lies, then making execution of those things almost effortless. The ultimate challenge of our day is not in finding things to do, but in choosing what is most important out of a myriad of options. Peter Drucker said, in a few hundred years, when the history of our time will be written from a long-term perspective, it is likely that the most important event historians will see is not technology, not the internet, not e-commerce. It is an unprecedented change in the human condition. For the first time, they will have to manage themselves. And society is totally unprepared for it. What are the three core issues being addressed by this book? Number one, individual choice. We can choose how to spend our energy and time. Without choice, there is no point of talking about trade-offs. Number two, the prevalence of noise. Almost everything is noise, and a very few things are exceptionally valuable. This is the justification for taking time to figure out what is most important. Because some things are so much more important, the effort in finding those things is worth it. Number three, the reality of trade-offs. We can't have it all and do it all. If we could, there would be no reason to evaluate or eliminate options. Once we accept the reality of trade-offs, we stop asking, How can I make it all work and start asking the more honest question, which problem do I want to solve? To find our bearings, to know how to navigate life with this one and only gift of life that has been handed to us, no one else can choose to prioritize. McEwen challenges us to ask, what do I feel deeply inspired by? And what am I particularly talented at? And what meets a significant need in the world? These questions lead to the ultimate individual and unique purpose. Everyone wants to feel that they are making a contribution in life. Without that, we are left with nothing but empty existentialism. Poet Mary Oliver wrote, Tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? This leads us to asking the critical question, if you could do only one thing with your life right now, what would you do? In the sacred scriptures, Paul the Apostle wrote, This one thing I do in Philippians 3.13. He didn't write these 40 things I dabble at. Essentialists see trade-offs as an inherent part of life, not as an inherently negative part of life. Instead of asking, what do I have to give up? They ask, what do I want to go big on? This begs the question, what are my strengths? What am I good at? What am I uniquely qualified to do? All of My history, background, difficulties, and challenges have prepared me for this season of life. I must keep my focus on the essentials, not the trivial inconsequentials. On December 29, 1972, Eastern Airlines Flight 401 crashed into the Florida Everglades, killing over 100 passengers. It was the first ever crash of a wide-body aircraft and one of the worst airline crashes in U.S. history. The investigators were later shocked to discover that, in all vital ways, the plane had been in perfect working condition. So what went wrong? The Lockheed jet had been preparing to land when First Officer Albert Stockstill noticed that the landing gear indicator, a tiny green light that signals the nose gear is locked down, hadn't lit up. Yet the nose gear was locked. The problem was the indicator light, not the gear function. While the officers were hyper-focused on the gear indicator, however, they failed to notice that the autopilot had been deactivated until it was too late. In other words, the nose gear didn't cause the disaster. The crews losing sight of the bigger problem, the altitude of the plane, did. This graphic and tragic illustration reminds us to keep our eyes on the main priorities, the activities that will move us forward strategically, 
These are lead measures, the items that can be leveraged to make the most progress for my ultimate purpose in life. Greg McEwen contends that getting adequate rest is a strategic advantage in life. Foggy thinking from sleep deprivation is a real detriment to peak performance, and it is no longer a badge of honor for executives. Fatigue is clearly the enemy of peak performance. While sleep is often associated with giving rest to the body, recent research shows that sleep is really more about the brain. Indeed, a study from the Lübeck University in Germany provides evidence that a full night's sleep may actually increase brain power and enhance our problem-solving ability. Bill Clinton was quoted as saying that every major mistake he had made in his life had happened as a result of sleep deprivation. Adequate sleep has been a common denominator for those who excel in the arts. The second most important factor differentiating the best violinists from the good violinists was actually sleep. The best violinists slept an average of 8.6 hours in every 24-hour period, about an hour longer than the average American. Over the period of a week, they also spent an average of 2.8 hours of napping in the afternoon about two hours longer than the average. Sleep, the authors of the study concluded, allowed these top performers to regenerate so that they could practice with greater concentration. So yes, while they practiced more, they also got more out of those hours of practice because they were better rested. Adequate rest leads to peak performance. And this is backed by solid research. Naps are a good thing, I'm glad to know that. Essentialism is driven by the question, if we could be truly excellent at one, at only one thing, what would it be? What is your one thing? Even Curly and City Slinkers knew the importance of one thing. So essentialism challenged me to get more serious about living a life of excellence. I want to excel in serving leaders. I want to give to leaders more than I receive. I want to excel in helping leaders be successful in what matters most. I want to excel in serving leaders by compassionately coaching them through the inevitable leadership pain and loneliness to the path of purpose and joy and contentment. In spite of setbacks and challenges, the College of Hard Knocks and the Seminary of Suffering can all be used by God for His purpose in life. God wastes nothing when I allow Him to develop perseverance and character in my life. I don't have to try to be somebody. I'm uniquely and securely in the hands of God who made me and designed me to make a contribution to His purpose and His will on this planet. Greg McEwen illustrates the importance of being at peace with who God created me to be. In the movie Tootsie, Dustin Hoffman plays a struggling actor who is trying to get work. The movie begins comically with a series of failed auditions. At one, he is told, we need someone a little older. At the next, he is told, we're looking for someone younger. Then at the next, you're the wrong height, to which he responds, I can be taller. The executive responds, no, we're looking for someone shorter. Desperate to make it work, Hoffman's character explains, look, I don't have to be this tall. See, I'm wearing lifts. I can be shorter. But the executive also insists, I know, but we're looking for somebody different. Still persistent, the would-be actor pushes back again, I can be different. The point is that we often act like Dustin Hoffman's character by trying too hard to be something we're not. Yet when I know who I am and what I am to do, it doesn't mean that everything will be easy peasy. It just means that I can lean into my strengths and work it for the good for all that it is worth. The way of the essentialist is not busyness like a rat on a treadmill, but of balance and priorities. Even Socrates was an essentialist ahead of his time. Beware the barrenness of a busy life, Socrates said. Some things never change. Staying busy is not the goal. But the way of the essentialist isn't just about success, it's about living a life of meaning and purpose. Too many today are suffering from success sickness. They have all the things that money can buy, but they don't have the things that money can't buy. Purpose, contentment, joy, and loving relationships. This all starts in the mind, thinking the right thoughts that lead to the right actions. But as the proverb goes, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. LinkedIn CEO Jeff Weiner understands the power of essentialism. Fewer things done better as the most powerful mechanism for leadership. This book will sharpen your thinking regarding the most important things in your life and will give you multiple tools for how to say no graciously and firmly to the trivialities that are bogging you down on the path of greater impact, purpose, and fulfillment in what really matters. 
okay, why in the world wouldn't you purchase this book? It's your life. Make this book an essential priority. You won't regret it. Be sure to like this video and subscribe for more of my book summaries coming to you. Bye for now. <laughs>